Hello everybody, my name is Nina and this is Nicholas. We are from the publisher NTZ, which is specialized in the rejuvenation field. We have published several books in this field, uh, especially translations into Portuguese and Spanish. And today we are uh, doing this video to mark the launch of the Portuguese version of the book Replacing Aging by Jean Herbert. Uh, Jean Herbert, I'm going to I'm going to read down here. <laughs> Jean Herbert was born in Quebec City and grew up in Montreal, Canada. He first trained as a molecular geneticist, obtaining his PhD from the University of California, San Francisco, before specializing in the study of how neural stem cells form the brain at Stanford University. He's he is now a professor of neuroscience and genetics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, where he is developing ways to use replacement cells to repair the, and rejuvenate the brain. And so today we're going to talk about his book, Replacing Aging. And just a, a summary of the book, uh, Replacing Aging outlines how aging will soon be reversible as a result of the advances that are being made in re regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is developing increasingly functional lab-grown cells, tissues, and organs that are being transplanted into patients today to treat diseases or repair damage. With continued improvements, cells and organs could be used in a more comprehensive manner to replace body parts and reset the aging clock to near zero. Even the brain can be progressively replaced at a cellular level over time without a loss of self-identity. Thus, this book heralds the day in the near future when, if we choose to, we will be able to live much longer and healthier lives as a result of replacements made possible by regenerative medicine. So, Jean is here today with us. And uh, a first question that I have for you, Jean, is could you uh, first briefly tell us uh, how this book came to be? What inspired you to write this book? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I started thinking about these things when I was very young, actually. And um, so writing the book, by the time you know I was uh, a couple of years ago when I wrote it, I already had everything percolating in my head. So it, you know, it wasn't, um, it came very easily to write, but I guess the reason I wrote it was uh, because there was this big gap in the field of longevity um, where researchers, scientists, investors were not paying much attention to regenerative medicine, instead paying attention to, you know, other approaches, more, more pharmacological based approaches which again, you know, may have benefits for health, but will unlikely for reasons I described a little bit more at length in the book, really uh, impact the aging process itself, which is independent of disease. So, although it causes disease clearly. Uh, so I felt there was this big gap because regenerative medicine um, will clearly allow us in the near future to replace parts of our body. And when we replace an old part with the young part, um, you know, it's going to be, uh, perform a lot better and it won't have age related damage to all of its uh, molecular components like the old tissue had. So clearly there is um, a lot of potential and I would even say the solution <laughs> to aging uh, within regenerative medicine, but it was largely ignored uh, I think it's gotten a little better, uh, but I think it's, we still have a long ways to go. So I think much of the longevity field is still very much focused on, you know, let's develop pills that we can take that will, you know, cure aging. But um, I, you know, I think the transition will occur to accepting replacement therapies more and more, uh, but we're not there yet. In any in any case, you know, I thought it was important to throw that out there in the field of longevity as, look, we need to be paying attention to regenerative medicine and organ replacements because there's tremendous progress being made in that field of regenerative medicine. Uh, Jean, uh, um, you, you said uh, in the book uh, that 
um, this there is a problem exactly and in the book and right now there there is this problem uh, regarding the the focuses on the pharmacological approaches however um there is the uh, partial reprogramming uh technique and this is not exactly a, a pharmacological approach so uh, i don't know if in this year since the the original publication of the book, something changes regarding that, but how uh, do you see this uh, emer emerging field of the reprogramming? Of course, you, you mentioned it uh, in, in the book, how it can relate to the replacement approach, but uh, I, um, I would like you to explore a bit uh, the development of the uh, reprogramming uh, technique and, and how it can fill some gaps that uh, the, the, the pharmacological approach can't, can't fill. Yeah, yeah, no, um, cellular rep reprogramming, like a lot of uh, concepts in the longevity field is, has value, but is often also misrepresented. So reprogramming uh, is not rejuvenation, it's de-differentiation of cells, which can have some applications and benefits to um, replacing tissues that are damaged, for example. So, you know, there was an example from David Sinclair's lab where he showed the optic nerve regrowth. Well, the regrowth occurred because the cells were de-differentiated, became a more uh, embryonic state. Um, and so then they were able to regrow their axons because mature adult cells don't do that. They don't regrow axons. So, <clears throat> so those kinds of approaches can be in fact useful to um, replacing damaged parts of the body. Um, but again, it's very different than rejuvenation. It's not reprogramming a cell does not get rid of any of the damage uh, that has occurred in the cell's environment. Um, and some would argue, well, it produces maybe new younger proteins, but if you don't remove the old ones that are there and there's no mechanism for doing that in the cell's environment, then you're, you're, you're not rejuvenating. It also doesn't remove DNA damage. So all the forms of molecular damage that are really at the heart of aging are not reversed by reprogramming. Um, so there are benefits, but you know, again, it, the, the enthusiasm for it has been is somewhat, I would say, exaggerated. And as a general approach to trying to reprogram undamaged tissues and cells to make them younger, just with these factors, I, I don't see that working. I mean, I'm a big fan of reprogramming. I mean, we use it in the lab for certain things um, and it's wonderful, but we're also very um, aware of the limitations. So it's a very inefficient process. So when you try to reprogram a population of cells, even a pure population of cells in culture, for example, that are not in the body, uh, the efficiency of reprogramming is, is very variable. So you have a lot of intermediate cells that are there at the end of the process. No one's been able to achieve like complete re reprogramming of a, even a pure cell type. Now imagine trying to do that in any tissue of the body where there's dozens of cell types for each tissue, trying to get, you know, you first have to come up with a way of very efficiently reprogramming each cell type, you know, which would require a different rate or, or a different degree of de-differentiation uh, to, to, to have it become more embryonic and and targeting those cells and usually that's done with viral delivery or other methods which can also be uh, have a lot of nasty side effects so so the idea of using and you again you wouldn't get rid of any of the damage right so again you wouldn't be addressing the core of aging so yet yeah, those cells might perform a little better for a little longer but they're still going to hit that plateau of when there's too much damage, nothing will work. It's also clear uh, from experiments done in many parts of the body that if you take very young embryonic 
cells uh, with like young epigenomes and you transplant them in an old environment without replacing the old environment, <clears throat> the tissue environment, the extracellular environment, they behave like old cells. So, you know, again, it, it's pretty clear that there are very big limitations to cellular reprogramming that are largely uh, ignored right now. Um, so again, it has some use, uses and we foresee um, that those uses will be important in some cases uh, for, for uh, tissue replacements in, in conjunction with tissue replacements. Uh, but on its own, um, you know, I, I, I'm not the only one who, who sees these limitations, right? Anybody who works with this sees these, uh, these limitations. Okay. Uh, so you talk, obviously, uh, the focus of the book is uh, replacing uh, old organs and old tissues with new ones, uh, usually also using tissue engineering, lab-grown uh, organs. And uh, you also talk a lot about the brain, about uh, replacing the brain. And so uh, I want to ask you, because uh, nowadays people consider like organ transplants a normal thing, like everyone uh, has heard about it, but that's not the same when it comes to the brain. <laughs> no one, no one uh, considers normal to, to transplant the brain. Uh, so you talk about this, how uh, this would be done in, in this context of rejuvenation in the book. Uh, so could you just briefly like give a teaser of the book and talk a bit about uh, the brain transplantation? Yeah, in the book, I entertain uh, two general approaches. One is more a cell-based approach for replacing uh, cells in the brain. And the other is more of a tissue approach. And I, you know, I, I discuss the pros and cons of, of both. And the reason they're different, a tissue versus cell, is because when you replace tissue, you replace not only the cells, but their extracellular surrounding, which again is where a lot of the damage accumulates and a lot of the problem exists when it comes to aging. So I think, you know, since the time I wrote the book, I think it's become even clearer to me that the tissue replacement approach is the one that we're pursuing uh, much more vigorously and the one that's more likely to work. And of course, yeah, you can't replace the whole brain at once. That's who we are. It's our self-identity. But there are a couple of um, misconceptions sometimes about what we need to do to replace uh, the brain, even progressively um, over time, without losing our self-identity. One is that our self-identity is encoded in these very specific set of you know, trillions of connections. And that's, that's really not the case. The way the neocortex works, yes, it has, you know, in the order of, of trillions of connections, but um, it's very plastic in how it encodes function. And, and this happens all the time, every day that our, our encoding changes. That's why we learn things. That's why we forget things. It's a very plastic substrate, in particular, the part of the brain that we use to think, uh, the, the conscious part of our brain, the neocortex. So even in humans, there's very good examples of major functions moving from one part of the neocortex to another without an interruption in function, without a change in self-identity. And that's again, because of this plasticity. It takes a while sometimes, so something even as complex as language can move to a completely new substrate in the brain um, without an interruption in function and without anybody noticing any difference in the person, including the person themselves. And, uh, but it takes time for something like language, you know, it could take three to five years for it to move from one part of the neocortex to another, uh, but it, it's possible. So, so the, the brain is this much more plastic organ in how it works. It's, it's really use-based. So if, if we slowly destroy the language center, for example, and stop talking, then we'll forget language. We won't. We'll, but if we slowly destroy the language center while we're talking every day, it will move. The language function will move to a different part. So it's very use-dependent. 
it evolved that way because that's what's useful to us to keep us alive, right? We, we, we function, uh, we focus on different tasks, then we learn, we get better at those tasks. You know, something's more important to us, we think about it more, we remember it better. Uh, so it's, it's exceedingly functional and plastic. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that, although this misconception is um, pretty much gone by the wayside by now, I hope, is that you, you cannot get regrowth of connections in the adult brain. That used to be the dogma. And um, that's when people severed the connections or the axons between neurons in the adult brain and saw there was, there's just no way to get them yet to grow back. Right. Well, you know, maybe reprogramming would be one way to get them to grow back, like we saw with the optic nerve. So there's a there's an application. But uh, in general, they won't do it on their own. But if you put embryonic uh, precursors to those cell types in the adult brain, they do what they would do uh, when we're young fetuses and, and newborns. They'll grow and project to the correct targets and uh, you know, physiologically integrate with those targets. And so that with plasticity tells us that replacement, even of the brain is possible if it's done progressively over time, allowing functions to move from old substrates to new substrates and then removing the old substrates when they're not being used anymore. Sure. Um, uh, you wrote in the book also, about the um, about the fact that in your opinion there are no genes that um, uh, make the the aging process uh, there are no aging genes uh, and indeed there is a debate in the um, anti aging or rejuvenation community uh, you, you you use the term anti anti aging research. Uh, in the book, and regarding if uh, if the aging process is programmed or not, I mean, if if the body actively uh, try to age or if it's a passive uh, process, and you um, uh, wrote in the book that there are no genes, uh, but uh, one question. Uh, is there the possibility that there are no specific genes for aging, but like a set of genes, a system? And instead of looking for individual genes, uh, maybe there is like a, a, a set, a system that uh, in some way uh, have an active role in, um, in make aging prog progressive. I mean, uh, could you elaborate a bit more about this this uh, debate uh, between programmed aging and non-programmed aging? Yeah, so I think um, that's a good question. And referring to them as aging genes is really important, right? To distinguish them from longevity genes. So there are lots of longevity genes. In fact, probably most of our genes are longevity genes because they all help keep us alive and functioning better. Right, so, so a lot of people are studying longevity genes and that's fine, that makes sense. Um, DNA repair genes are probably the, the best example of that. So they help keep us there longer, but, but what you're talking about is in fact what, you know, there, I guess there is some debate in the field <coughs> that there are genes that evolved to purposely make us age, right? Or a system of genes that evolved to purposely make us age. And, and there's really no evidence of this. That's the problem. There's like no evidence of this. And not only that, but it's hard to imagine how such a system would have had the opportunity to evolve given that, um, you know, as, as of fairly recently, uh, you know, the human population and most natural populations, individuals die uh, before they grow old, right? So there's no opportunity for natural selection, Darwinian selection, to occur, to select for such genes or uh, sets of genes, you know, the systems of genes that would have as their purpose to make us get older, you know, faster than we would just from 
accumulation of damage and breaking down over time, right? So some people give examples like, oh, look at the salmon, you know, it purposely dies uh, and there are other species as well where they, they, they're programmed to undergo rapid death. But uh, in, in those cases, the programming is more behavioral programming, like the animals stop eating they, you know, once they mate so that their offspring can, can use them as a source of food. Or, you know, there's different examples in, in nature, but that's not aging. That, those are behavioral programs that have evolved in that case, because they really help the species propagate. And so they're a result uh, of natural selection. But there's simply no evidence for such a thing in, in mammals. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a concept that you know, had its time, but I, I think it's, you know, we, we have to let go of that at this point. OK. And uh, well, uh, you talk a lot about the the regenerative approach and uh, replacement therapy. And uh, one thing that I think everybody <laughs> who is in this field wants to know is uh, how close do you think we are to achieve rejuvenation, either by using this approach or other approaches or a combination? Uh, do you, can you give a, a timeline or some kind of prediction? Yeah, <laughs> I think it, I, I think it could happen. Uh, it could happen relatively quickly, but it depends on two things. One, whether um, we focus on the right approaches, and you know I'm biased, it's gonna be replacing things uh, at the tissue level or organ level. Um, and the other is, you know, how, how, open are we to this type of approach? Because it's, you know, it make, a lot of people are uncomfortable with it. It involves surgeries and, and who likes surgery? Nobody, right? We, we, we would all like to avoid that. Um, even brain surgery, right? Although brain surgeons are, you know, wonderful people. They, they like to break new ground and do things that no one's ever done before. They're, they're an interesting group. Uh, and, and, you know, brain surgeries are performed every day on people. So it's not like it's completely novel. But, uh, but it is sort of a, um, an approach that is scary to think about at first, if, if you haven't thought about it. Uh, but there are steps that can be done to, um, you know, facilitate a transition from an old body to a young body, tackling first the the, the organs that are uh, in most need of rejuvenation. So, you know, kidney, heart, uh, maybe lungs. Um, and I don't know, the brain, I would, I would say, is, is, is important to get that started early as well, because that would take a certain amount of time to progressively uh, replace the brain. Um, but this can all be done, I think, within a, um, a reasonable amount of time. Um, I mean, develop the technology to be able to do this. Uh, I just heard a talk from Anthony Atala's lab, and, and he's one of many labs working on uh, all different body parts uh, and growing in the lab and being able to replace them. And, and they've had success replacing body parts in, in human patients, uh, tremendous success. They're not easy things to do, though, and so they require great investments and uh, persistence and, and effort. And so it, it sort of depends, you know, how much we want to invest in this and, and how ready we are to do this. Because we can, if we decide to, then I'm, there's nothing, there's no biological reason why we won't succeed, right? This will be doable. Um, it's, it's the same for what we work on. So replacing tissue in the brain, there are, you know, every, Time we think about how we're going to do it, there is at least 10 different ways. And because we don't have the support or the funding, we have to test these sequentially rather than in parallel. So, you know, we would go 10 times faster if we could test it in parallel rather than sequentially. So it requires a lot of effort on the part of scientists, but it also takes the will of people 
uh, and investors to accelerate this, to make it happen within a shorter period of time. So I'm optimistic though. I think we can do this relatively quickly if we decide that we really want to. Yes, um, reading your book, um, um, I think uh, there is a, an advanced phrase by Aubrey de Grey in which he says that replacing and repairing are similar things, uh, but depends on the scale uh, in which you are looking at. If you look microscopically or it can be replacing, but if you look macroscopically, it can be repairing. Yeah. And the opposite. The opposite. No, I think is it because the, the organ seems seems repair it, but it is repair it ah. because you replace it tissues or well. Yeah. And and I I I I thought about a, a an analogy uh, regarding the repairing of the rest restoration, the repairing of um, paintings, ancient paintings. And Nina and I sometimes uh, watch uh, videos of uh, people uh, repairing uh, paintings, old paintings. And you know, you see the, the painting as if it, is, if it were repaired. But in fact, what, when the video shows exactly what the uh, the job uh, did that in the painting you see that there is a lot of replacing because they replace uh, the materials they replace the paint the painting the, uh, the, the paint they replace a uh, mechanism uh, to fix the, the the painting and in the end uh, the, the the painting seems repaired, but there is a lot of uh, replacement. There, it's a new, it's a new young painting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, in fact, it, it's an analogy. Maybe it can be used to explain what you are me meaning with uh, replacing. It's it's re it's 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 repairing, but using. A lot of replacements. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there's a big overlap between uh, replacement and repairing. Um, I think, though, that the the important distinctions are at what level are you replacing or repairing? Are you doing a molecular level, a cellular level, a tissue level, an organ level, or you know, the highest level would be like a whole body replacement. <laughs> um, so. You know what what is going to work what is going to be more effective and um you know uh aubrey has been a trailblazer in this field i mean he's uh he's one of the few people who understands that if we do not deal with the molecular damage that accumulates over time then um we won't be aging period uh and he's right um and, and so we largely agree. Uh, I think he's a little more optimistic about replacements at um, smaller levels or repair at smaller levels, like a molecular level. Um, I think that there is many, there's way too many forms of molecular damage that occurs to proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, DNA. And so some of those to the carbohydrates and proteins occur outside of cells. So there's currently no enzymatic machinery that exists in life that will specifically target that damage and repair it. Um, and, and so we, you know, being able to repair these things, all these forms of damage um, at the molecular level without interfering with normal processes seems to me impossible. So um, I think there are benefits that can come from trying to target major forms of repair. And I think that's what Aubrey's been focusing on. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a good idea. But I think the simplest way to repair all the forms of damage is to do replacements at the tissue or organ level. 
you get rid of all the extracellular damage, all the cellular damage um, of all the types of macromolecules all in one shot, right? Because when we grow organs in the lab or tissue in the lab, it's from embryonic cells that were very undifferentiated cells. And so, and we can do quality control on them so to make sure they have no DNA damage or other forms of damage. And we make a pristine new damage-free organ or tissue. Right. I, I, I think this is going to be ultimately what's going to work. So that level of replacement. So yeah, replacement, repair, big overlap conceptually, uh, but it's all in, in how we plan on doing it. Right. Um, another thing in, in the book, you defend uh, uh, transplanting several organs at the same time or, or in a short period of time. And you said that uh, this is uh, important to minimize any deleterious effect that old organs might have on the new ones. Could you uh, talk a bit about that? What uh, deleterious effects uh, would those be? So, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you guys have heard of, of young blood versus old blood. And, and so, so there are environmental uh, factors that affect the functioning of organs, either in a bad way. So old blood is, is not good for young organs. Um, <clears throat> it's not as clear, but young organs might, or young, at least a circulatory system and young blood might help uh, older organs perform a little better, at least for a little while longer. Again, without really getting, replacing, uh, you know, addressing the core of aging, which is the, the damage that accumulates, but still by, may improve performance a little bit. Uh, so, so the environment that we will be putting young organs in will be a, an older environment. And so we have to be conscious of that. So maybe combining it with a young circulatory system so replacing you know, the bone marrow niche and the bone marrow stem cells uh, would be one of the earlier things we want to replace because then the circulating blood cells will be younger. Um, and so so you know, it, is a, it is something that needs to be thought out of, uh, thought out very carefully. What, what order do we want to do this in to maximize the benefit of the young organs and minimize the effect of the remaining old tissues and organs on those young organs. Um, but that, you know, that would be the approach. Um, people wonder about vasculature too. You know, how do you replace the vasculature? It's everywhere. Well, that's done at the tissue level. So when you replace an organ, it's a vascularized organ. That's how, that's how regenerative medicine has been doing it and will continue to do it. Same for the brain. When we replace brain tissue, what we're doing is replacing the vasculature at the same time. So it's young vessels, brand new young vessels in those tissues. Um, so that's uh, just wanted to make that clear as well. Right. Joe, sure. um, uh, in, in your book, uh, there are many uh, hard subjects. I mean, in, in terms of social, um, social uh, acceptation, like um, using uh, bodies, um, growing lab and something like this. And reading the book and during translation, I, I, uh, I it, it, re it reminds me of a movie I, I watched that uh, maybe, I don't know if you watch it, this movie, it's called Get Out. Uh, it, it's, it's a movie in which some of the techniques you propose are used, but they are used in, in a uh, unethically way. So if you want later look for this, this movie, uh, it's called Get Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I saw it, yeah. Maybe you you know what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. It's great, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I I would like to ask you uh, since you published the, the original version of the book in English, you received some uh, comments regarding this this kind of approach. Some maybe negative, 
comments or a resistance in that regard? Um, not, I mean, hesitancy by people. So a lot of people, so most of the people who read my book are in the longevity field. So they're already sort of open to the idea of, of at least uh, living longer. Uh, and so they're more receptive to the ideas in the book. Um, and I've spoke to other people who are non-scientists and, and not into longevity. And I guess they're more resistant to the idea of a more wholesale type of approach, which is I think what you're referring to, right? So there's a chapter in the book where, and I have to put it in because for, for completeness, you know, it is, it is something that we need to think about. And that's replacing uh, the whole body at once with a new body, right? So this is this would actually be the fastest way to beat aging because, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we need technologically to be able to do that have been done. Right? So, so it's a very small step to apply it to to humans in principle, uh, it, but it leaves the brain on still old brain and young body is still a problem. So we would still have to address the brain, but at least for replacement of the body, that's, that's doable. Um, we know how to grow bodies, you know, women know how to grow bodies. And, and so volunteer consenting women can do this. We know how to, uh, to grow bodies that are entirely brain dead from the start. So there's, there's simple ways that, that we can do this. Um, and so that there's no person in that body. It's, it's a completely like an empty shell. Um, and we know how to do uh, head transplants or, you know, at least we've done that, you know, some, some scientists in the past have successfully uh, done that. Well, was a doctor in particular uh, and was ready to do it in humans. And then more recently, there's uh, an Italian doctor uh, that, that's been um, wanting to do this, but uh, did not or has not at least yet had the opportunity. But the protocols are there um, and it's been done in, in smaller primates. Um, and so we know it's possible. Uh, so this is an approach that, you know, for, for the sake of completeness in terms of replacement strategies is one that, you know, we, I have to consider for the book and whether people want to consider it in, in, in real life is, is up to them, uh, but it is a possibility. Uh, and it is the quickest way to replace all body parts. There's a spinal cord uh, reattachment that that is the biggest technological hurdle. But again, there for, you know, for at least uh, a couple of decades, we've been able to have people with completely severed <clears throat> spinal cords, quadriplegics, uh, be able to drink on a cup of tea on their own, right, with uh, brain machine interfaces bypassing the spinal cord injury. And the technology since then has improved quite a bit. Neuralink, Elon Musk's, uh, one of his companies, right, uh, has been developing these much smaller, more portable uh, devices, brain machine interfaces that allow for uh, movement of body parts. Uh, without going through the spinal cord. So even that is something that is, you know, on the verge of, of happening. So, you know, I have that chapter in the book that is um, provocative, I guess, but it's science. And if it's done right, no sentient being gets hurt. So the question is, is it immoral to pursue that? Or is it immoral not to pursue that? Because if it means saving the lives of people, uh, and we're not doing it because we're not comfortable with it, is that morally justified? Um, so just throwing that out there for us to think about. <laughs> yeah, uh, one thing related to, to that is also, I wanted to ask you about cryopreservation because there are uh, some people uh, who are interested in rejuvenation therapies, but they might not be alive uh, when they arrive. So do you think cryopreservation is a good choice? And uh, uh, a lot of people are thinking about crime preserving just the brain. So uh, I think this, this kind of uh, whole body replacement would also be useful for that. So yeah. what do you think? 
Yeah, and, and you know, I think they have the right attitude in most cases of thinking about cryopreservation as a last resort, um, primarily because, you know, we can freeze things or vitrify, uh, you know, brains, people, but we don't have the technology and we don't know what the technology will look like to reanimate these tissues. So it's, it's a bit of a leap of faith uh, to do this. Uh, and so as a last resort, you have nothing to lose, right? Why not? Um, so I think in that context, it makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, I would encourage people to be a little more optimistic about, you know, regenerative medicine and replacements. These are things that are going to work. So why take that leap of faith that one day, if you know society keeps preserving your body for hundred, or, you know, however long it takes, a long time, um, and they develop the means of reanimating, which again, I, we, it, right now we, it's really hard to imagine how that might work because it's very difficult to bring vitrified tissue back to metabolic temperatures without everything you know falling apart and degrading but you know in the future who knows maybe there'll be a way but instead of taking that leap of faith you know let's put our effort into approaches that we believe uh, will work and hopefully get there before we need to be vitrified <laughs> yeah Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, um, your proposal, your approach uh, of replacing, indeed, it's, um, it's very... We, we used to uh, watch, like, um, on television, sometimes the journalists report about new organs, and uh, we are always uh, wondering how, how close is that? It's like Nina asked you, uh, because sometimes people just uh, show the interesting thing, but it's a bit disconnected of the practical use. But indeed, uh, when we see hearts grown in the lab or artificial kidneys, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a concrete hope for many people who, who suffer of these organ uh, problems. And uh, so your book is... is uh, it's not just uh, a thing for the future, like rejuvenation as a concept, but it resonates as well with traditional medicine because uh, the lack of organs is, is a problem all the time, you know, uh, especially a heart or kidney, liver. So uh, your books resonate with both fields, the traditional medicine and, and um, the, the anti-aging, rejuvenation medicine, and uh, especially one part that uh, it was, I, I'm sorry if I'm making a comment, but uh, a part that I, I, I thought very interesting about the plasticity of the brain, because in the anti-aging or rejuvenation field, people is talking about rejuvenation, but if people is with uh, the brain in a bad state, like a bit of dementia or Alzheimer disease, maybe you will think, oh, but you can recover the body, but not the mind. But the, the plasticity of the brain, all the techniques you describe in the book uh, can be important independently of the method of rejuvenation. Because you can uh, recover the mind. And that's another interesting uh, aspect of the book, you know? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, past a certain point of dementia or, you know, it, it's gonna be difficult or impossible to recover who you are when you were younger, right? You have to, these tissue replacements, will work to preserve who you are, not to recover who you were. 
right? There's no way, um, unless somehow you can, you know, in Alzheimer patients, there are moments of lucidity. So there, some of you is still buried in there. Uh, so there may be ways of bringing that out uh, uh, and activating those and, and preserving those. But, but, you know, we can't wait too long before implementing uh, these approaches of tissue replacement for the brain, because at some point, you know, the person is gone, right, with, with Alzheimer's or, or different forms of dementia. Um, but yes, I mean, it can, if you're doing it early enough, you, you can um, slow, prevent, or reverse the progression of the disease and preserve uh, who that person was when you started these approaches. Um, <clears throat> but I'm glad you brought up too, for the rest of the body, that these, these, this technology of tissue and organ replacement is very important for people who are just trying to live uh, normal length lives, right? That have kidney failure, that have uh, heart problems or, or you know, lung problems. So, you know, regenerative medicine has made tremendous strides even since I wrote the book, you know, like a year and a half ago. Um, there are many more examples now of transplants in humans and even more examples of preclinical organs being tested. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think um, that's why I'm very optimistic. Great. Um, well, I think that's all the questions we had for you. Uh, thank you, Jean, for, for talking to us. Yeah, thanks for having me and, and for this translation of my book. I very much appreciate it. Of course. So uh, anyone who is watching, if you speak English, the book is available in English by uh, Science Unbound, which is the original publisher. And uh, now the book is also available in Portuguese by our publisher, NTZ. Uh, so you can go check it out. And uh, Jean, do you have like a website or anything that people uh, who might want to contact you? Uh, yeah, I have a lab website. It's, it's kind of a long, um you know, address. We'll put the link in, in the screen and also in the description of the of the video. Okay. Uh, okay. Congratulations for your book, for your work, and and for working in, in the anti-aging or rejuvenation field because we need so much scientists uh, in this field because we have to save save lives. You know. Yep. And so uh, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, too. This is a global effort, and what you're doing is, is very important. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you.